Morning, everybody. <laughs> we're uh, we're running about ten minutes behind, so we wanna we wanna get started um, because we we have some of our families affected families are still on the road now. Uh, we will be starting our testimony with panel A. So if you're on panel A, officer wellness, then please be prepared to get started. But uh, as soon as everybody takes their seats, we'll do some introductory comments and introductions, and then we'll we'll get started with panel A. So, uh, good, let me just say good good morning. My name is uh, Keith Ellison. I'm the uh, Attorney General for the State of Minnesota. I'm very uh, honored uh, to be co-chairing a working group on reducing deadly force encounters with police. Uh, very honored to have such an uh, excellent uh, working group and co-chair. The goal is to reduce deadly force encounters. Uh, and I just want to just point out for everyone that um, we do have a, an, an, an editorial board uh, op-ed uh, that was put out uh, for this morning in the Star Tribune. I want to uh, urge everybody to read this particular document. It's helpful. Um, uh, Commissioner Harrington and I uh, went to go talk to the Star Tribune editorial board and were able to uh, talk to them about this critical issue. They agree that it's a critical issue 
and talked about it in their editorial this morning, which we commend to you. Um, this work that we're doing is critically important, and one of the statistics that has come out and that I'm very aware of is that about 60% of the deadly force encounters happen in greater Minnesota. People may think of this as a metro issue, but it's not. It is something that engages our whole state. You could even argue our whole country. So it makes sense to focus our attention on this, a critical issue on a statewide basis. That's why we're very pleased to be in Mankato today. I want to thank the president and the regents of Mankato uh, yeah, and uh, at, at MSU. It's a wonderful facility and we're glad to be here. Uh, and so with that, let me move it over to my co-chair, Mr. John Harrington. Good morning. Uh, once again, I want to thank all of you that have made the trip to Mankato. Uh, it, it is a blessing to be here. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, part of the mandate that I've been given by my, by my boss, Governor Walls, is that, that we're supposed to be looking at things as one Minnesota. And so it's important for us to be not just in the metro area, but we have to be in, in greater Minnesota. And uh, I recognize, as Keith has just pointed out, that deadly force encounters don't know any one jurisdiction. They don't know any one area. Um, they do know some trend lines, though. And so one of the things you're seeing today is a slightly expanded group uh, for the working group. Uh, we have added folks from the disability community uh, because, uh, as we pointed out in our first meeting, over 50% of the deadly force encounters involve somebody that has either mental health or some kind of disability. So we are very pleased to have expanded our working group. Uh, we are also very pleased that all of you have made the trip today with us. Uh, it, it, this is, I really want to emphasize, this is some of the most important work that I think the state can possibly be engaged in. Uh, the goal here is nothing less than to save lives, uh, to save young people's lives in our communities, save lives of officers, and to save, uh, to restore and to build on the trust that communities and their police departments have to have if we're to function as a civil society. So with that note, uh, are we gonna do introductions or are we just gonna jump right into the testimony? I think we're gonna do a few introductions. Uh, you, you wanna start, uh, James? Uh, Jim Koppel, I'm uh, with Strategic Applications International and 21 CP. We're helping to facilitate uh, the task force process. I'm Patina Park. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center, and I'm in Kajula, Kota. Justin Page, I'm an attorney at the Minnesota Disability Law Center. State Senator Bill Ingebrigtsen, Alexandria. Matt Gottschalk, the Director of Public Safety and Corporate, and representing the <coughs> Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association. Good morning, Brian Peters, the Executive Director with the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. Artika Tyner, University of St. Thomas, law professor. John Harrington, Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Keith Ellison. Madeira Arredondo, Minneapolis Police Chief. Mark Kappelhoff, uh, Hanover County District Court Judge. Sarah Rice, Chief of Police for the Mille Lacs Tribal Police Department. Uh, Eliza Garris, ACLU of Minnesota. Mark Rubin, St. Louis County Attorney and here for the Minnesota County Attorney's Association. I would like to note that we do have some members who cannot be here. They told us in advance they wouldn't be able to be. Representative Rena Moran has a fixed schedule for this day and so couldn't join us, but it's still very much uh, a part of the work that we're doing. Uh, also, um, Chandra uh, Baker, Smith Baker, uh, is not able to join us today, but is very much of a part of our deliberations and actively pursuing her work with our committee and uh, Brittany Lewis as well, uh, and Dr. Brittany Lewis, a demographer, sociologist, uh, had, uh, was, is unable to be here with us today, but all three of them are active, engaged, and very, uh, very much a part of our working group. And so with that, would you like to introduce her? Um, I do want to add one other thing to this, to, that the working group testimony, I think, is, is, is an essential component of what we're doing. So we're delighted to have folks today to actually to physically be here and testify. But one of the things that we mentioned in the op-ed piece right, is right, right. that we are open to information, testimony, in a variety of other ways. And so while uh, coming here today uh, or at our next working group meeting, which will be at Fond du Lac uh, in October, uh, is one option. Another option is simply to send us your suggestions, your white papers, your research, your ideas to us through the Department of Public Safety's website. Uh, we are keeping all of that. We are having this videotape so that uh, we are going to make this as transparent a process as we possibly can. Uh, and so on that note, I will introduce Mr. Sean Smoot, uh, 21st Century Policing, uh, and he's going to give us a presentation. 
Thank you, Commissioner, co-chairs, uh, members of the working group. My name is Sean Smoot. I'm a principal consultant with 21CP Solutions. Uh, I believe many of you uh, know me or have met me as part of this process, part of our support facilitation of your work. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to speak to you this morning about the Law Enforcement uh, Mental Health and Wellness Act, uh, which was passed uh, by Congress and signed into law on January 17, 2018. Um, the act itself uh, was a product of bipartisan, uh, bicameral uh, congressional action in support of a recommendation set that's included in President Obama's task force on 21st century policing um, under the pillar of officer safety and wellness. Um, I will uh, be uh, as brief as I possibly can. I'm just gonna give you uh, a run through of, of two reports which were required uh, by the statute to be, uh, 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 to be done. And the reason that I'm actually the person uh, presenting to you this morning is I led the team um, that wrote the uh, case studies report. Uh, so of the two teams, one was one of the reports uh, was written by COPS office staff, and I will uh, go through that report as well. Um, and and uh, through a uh, collaborative agreement with the COPS office, 21CP Solutions was, was uh, retained to write the case studies report, and we have consistently, since their release a few months ago, um, done reports on these uh, across the United States. Um, Let me just talk uh, very briefly about the methodology that was used uh, in the reports. And by the way, uh, at the end of my presentation, there will be a website on the screen so that members of the public, the people who are watching uh, online uh, that couldn't be here can see where they can get these reports as well. Uh, I believe they're in your, uh, in your materials for today's meeting. Um, so with regard to the recommendations report, uh, the statute re required a consultation um, the COPS office did uh, extensive work with the VA uh, and the Department of Defense uh, because those agencies, frankly, have done a, a great deal of work on mental health for uh, our military uh, folks uh, who have a lot of the same subset of mental health issues that police officers do uh, as a result of being exposed to, to uh, trauma. Um, the case studies report, we actually broke into teams. We did a survey of what programs are being used across the United States uh, in terms of officer wellness, uh, health and wellness, and particularly focused on mental health programming. We identified 10 police departments that had a very good uh, and historical uh, programs. By historical, I mean they've, they've actually, they'd actually been in uh, involved in doing officer safety programs for a number of years. Um, we broke into teams and we did actual site visits uh, where a researcher, uh, a, a member of our consultant staff and writers went out and visited each of these 10 jurisdictions. The 11th case study was a national uh, telephone hotline uh, list that officers can call into for mental health services. Um, Quickly, highlights from the recommendation report. The recommendation report included 21 um, recommendations. Um, in addition to, to supporting development of resources for uh, community-based clinicians interacting with law enforcement, there are frankly many communities where that isn't available right now. Um, we also uh, found that through the work that the DOD was doing and the VA was doing is really, really important to have support programs for law enforcement families, not just the officers themselves, but their spouses, their significant other, uh, 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 their children, and in some cases, their parents. Um, we also uh, identified that the importance of having model policies available uh, to implement guidance for agencies um, as you probably know, uh, I've heard it's gotten a good deal of press lately. Uh, police officers today, um, well, I shouldn't say today because I think it's been happening for a long time, but we're actually paying attention to it today and, and counting. But the number of officer suicides has increased exponentially over the last 10 years. Uh, a report came out uh, that was done by the law enforcement uh, uh, officers memorial 
in Washington, D.C. Uh, last year that um, indicated your chances of being killed by your own hand as a police officer are 40 percent, I'm sorry, 400 percent higher than being shot and killed by somebody, uh, by an offender. Um, that's a really shocking statistic. Uh, I can tell you as of two weeks ago, um, we have documented over 140 officers this year alone who have taken their own lives. And, um, and I would just note for the record, this is only the second year that we've actually started counting. Somebody's actually started counting officer suicides. Um, so this is an extremely serious uh, situation uh, in law enforcement. It's one of the probably top two front burner issues in law enforcement today. Um, obviously, having research to, to determine if there's, uh, what programs work, what kind of things work, um, is also extremely important. Um, I don't want to just read through this PowerPoint presentation, but I, I do want to kind of focus in on um, peer support, uh, peer programs, those do have a good deal of efficacy. There is a good deal of research that supports their use. Um, and um, this is an area where uh, a lot, of, I think a lot of resources will be focused on going forward, particularly because of the mental health crisis that exists within law enforcement uh, and the real crisis that we have in, in terms of suicides. Um, probably the biggest and most important recommendation in here is the second from the bottom on the screen there, um, the improvement of, of legislative privacy protections for peer support programs. This, is, uh, this was also a, a recommendation that was included in the uh, President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing um, uh, under the uh, auspices of uh, not only peer support but also Sentinel event reviews, which are uh, non-blaming uh, post-incident reviews, similar to those that are done in, uh, by NTSB or in the medical profession after uh, uh, after a, an un, uh, undesirable outcome occurs. So um, I, I highlight that for you because you did ask for some concrete recommendations, and um, there are a few states that have uh, extended privacy protections to peer support. Uh, peer counseling. Uh, my state, uh, I, I'm a resident of the state of Illinois, um, our governor just signed a couple weeks ago uh, a law extending privacy protections for peer support for first responders, um, so including police, fire, EMS folks. Um, it's extremely important because of, uh, as, as you well know, I, I would hope that the public knows, you know, for a police officer to um, seek out mental health treatment, can expose them to, uh, through public records disclosure, um, you know, disclosure of, of matters of, that would not, a, a normal citizen like myself, and many of you would not be subject to. Um, and uh, we know that uh, from the research that we've done, if officers believe that um, they're seeking uh, mental health treatment, um, can be made public or could be used as, uh, as an impetus for an adverse employment action, they won't do it. And uh, what we know also is that if there can be intervention at an earlier stage, um, we've seen mental health officers recover very quickly. Um, we know that some of the uh, highly publicized incidents over the years have occurred and looking back in retrospect, officers involved had PTSD issues for instance. Um, those things could have been addressed prior to the incident occurring. And so um, the point is we really want to encourage officers to um, seek professional help if they need it, to seek peer counseling uh, if they feel the need for it, and we don't want to have hurdles or obstacles placed in their way or have them apprehensive to, to seek those services. Um, so uh, and finally, um, recommendation is development of whole health programs. Uh, mental health and physical health are very closely related. Um, there's a, a significant amount of research supporting that uh, statement, um, which is included in the reports. Um, but what we know is that if a person is physically unwell, 
um, that has a, a, an impact on their mental health, and if they have, uh, uh, or if they're not mentally well, that has an impact on their physical health, whether that is because of you know, overeating, um, emotional eating, that kind of stuff uh, can lead to obesity and, and heart disease, but also just the stress. If you're not, if you've been exposed to trauma and the stress is there, uh, that actually has a very real impact. And there's been a good deal of research on that, in particular with, when, with regards to police officers, their life expectancy is, is significantly lower than the general population. Um, in terms of, I'm going to shift gears now to the second report, which is a case uh, case study sites report. Before you, yes, before you do that, yes. Uh, I just want to correct an assumption I have. The reason that the that the peer support uh, information is not private is because uh, it's connected to disciplinary records and or because of the fact that the peer support are not licensed therapists and psychologists. Or where is that? Where does that line get? So it's actually uh, goes to the latter. Okay. Um, they're not, uh, now some people don't, aren't aware of this, so I'm glad you asked that question, Commissioner. Um, they are not what would be considered a HIPAA record. They're not a, a, a health record. Uh, at least they're not classified as such by federal law. And so one of the things that uh, we recommend on, and what the report recommends on the federal side is that Congress actually extend that HIPAA protection to uh, peer support groups and peer counseling groups. Um, but on a state-by-state state level, um, you're now seeing states do that. I know Hawaii has, has adopted it. Washington has done something. As I said, Illinois just, uh, just within the last few weeks has, has implemented such a law. Just to follow up, so it sounds like you're saying that the federal law doesn't necessarily preempt it and states do have jurisdiction to act in this space. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So that, that'd be, that's an important thing. Yeah, and I think right. if you look on a state-by-state -state basis, uh, General, um, what you'll see is um, in terms of medical records or doctor-patient confidentiality, mm -hmm. uh, even attorney-client privilege, um, those, those things are all included in state statute. Yeah, yeah. Well, I leaned over to, to the chief and asked him, isn't that HIPAA? And, he's, and so I'm glad you guys cleared that up because uh, it's actually something that uh, – Something I think we should pay close attention to. I do yes, have a question. Yes, do you sir. know whether the Minnesota Data Practices Act could apply and whether this would be private under the Data Data Practices Act? I don't. I would say this some departments too partner. So um, they will partner and include a, a um, psychologist or a licensed clinical. Uh, social worker, somebody of that nature to work in the peer groups as a way to, to try to trigger a, a privilege. Others um, use chaplains, and, uh, but that has not legally been tested. And um, part of the issue with using chaplains is, is frankly, there aren't enough um, to, to actually embed in these peer-to-peer -peer, um, counselors, uh, with peer-to-peer -peer counselors. And there's a there's a, um, it's a, the law is even less clear in terms of uh, if you have a, a lay person who's assigned to or working under a chaplain's supervision, whether or not that privilege extends to them. Um, that would normally apply to, to a clergyman. So um, let me, uh, if, if I may, I know you have a good deal of, of testimony I, to give I as well. A question. What, yes, real, real quickly, yeah. do you have model legislation from those states that have, that have passed that? We, we can certainly provide that Could to the that? committee. That um, I, I won't call it necessarily model legislation, but I, we can certainly provide you with the statutes that other states have passed. Thank you. Of course. Um, so in terms of the case studies, um, these are the jurisdictions that, that um, are included in the report. The cop to cop uh, program is, the, is the, um, basically a toll free number that officers can call and they are then connected with uh, a trained uh, either current or retired uh, police officer um, to, to provide them with, and these are actually people who are trained. They, this is operated out of Rutgers University. Um, it's, it's probably one of the most robust um, telephone counseling systems, uh, certainly in the public safety space uh, in the world. Um, 
So, uh, and they, because they're associated with the university, they actually have a, a lot of data that they've collected and a lot of research that's been done to show um, the, the kind of the success of their program. Uh, cop to cop was something that um, kind of emerged after the tragedy of 9 11. Um, and we had, you know, literally thousands of first responders and police officers in need of mental health care. Um, and, and there was nowhere for them to go. So even though it's based in New Jersey and it's, and it's uh, at Rutgers University, um, it, it, its impetus was for New Jersey and New York City police officers and Port Authority police officers to have, uh, to have these services. Um, just give you uh, some, some oversight, um, kind of putting all of the, all 11 of the sites um, together um, some common themes that occurred uh, and, and made these programs really successful was um, a combination of leadership from within the department, leadership from um, the superintendent, commissioner, police chief, um, and, and their staff, and leadership by the association or union that represents the officers. So some of these jurisdictions are in right to work states, some of them are in, in uh, states like uh, Minnesota that is not right to work, uh, where, where officers have the right to unionize. Um, and, and in both cases, um, it was essential, it was the essential piece of the success of the program. In a lot of cases, the foundation of the program was leadership from the rank and file representative groups. Um, if they are not part of that buy-in, um, that's another hurdle that comes up for officers to use the services. So. Um, you know, what we found is the most successful are, are actually programs where the administration of the department and the organization representing the members of the department work together to build a program. Um, I will just tell you in Nashville, one of the programs where I did the, uh, where I personally did the site visit and, and some of the writing and, um, you know, the impetus of the Nashville program in and of itself was not just the chief of police it was seeded by uh, their local FOP. And, and when I say seeded, they actually provided some money um, to, to start the program. And now it's a line item in the city's budget. They have their own office. They have their own uh, building away from the police department. It's really a, a substantial and robust uh, mental health provider uh, within, the, within the department there. So um, again, common elements included peer support, implementing or, or working with the chaplaincy, um, integrating EAP benefits, uh, and including spouse and family services, um, including things like we don't normally equate with mental health, but financial counseling, uh, which is one of the areas that, you know, it was discovered a lot of officers, that was a, a significant cause of, of problems for them uh, in terms of stress, in terms of, of their mental health. Um, and so uh, uh, many of the programs include that, that kind of counseling as well. Um, we saw uh, uh, there's a number of different ways to do this. Some departments have in-house psychologists, others partner with uh, agencies outside of the department. Some um, use EAP solely, um, some don't. EAP is, can be a limiting thing. Uh, EAP programs tend to have a very limited structure and availability of services for officers. Um, so for instance, there are a number of EAP programs that only afford officers two to three sessions with a counselor if they're dealing with uh, an alcohol or drug issue. Um, anybody who knows about the disease of addiction and, um, and what it takes to recover if you're uh, an addict or an alcoholic knows that um, usually two to three sessions is not gonna solve the problem. It's, it's typically a much longer, uh, longer term situation. So uh, while EAP is okay, um, in most cases, it's, it's really kind of just to get the ball rolling. It's, it's, not, gonna, um, it's not gonna provide the kind of coverage that these officers need to fully recover. So um, that, that, is a, that is an issue that needs to be looked at. Um, a lot of agencies have programs that start very early in the officer's career one of the most successful in Indianapolis. Um, when you're a recruit, when you get hired, your first day you show up at the academy, you're assigned a mentor. And 
that's somebody that's an officer, another officer that's a volunteer, volunteers to be a mentor, that's been on the department that has several years of experience, and um, that's a person that you can call even after they retire. So officers have uh, kind of a steady hand that they can always, they can always go to for advice uh, and assistance. Um, and no surprise, um, I don't think, but trust is really the cornerstone of, of every successful program. If the officers don't trust that they can participate in me and, and get mental health services and not have that information somehow disclosed to their peers or to the public, um, they're not going to they're not going to utilize the services. And um, if the similarly, if the association that represents officers doesn't have that trust in the department they're going to tell their officers not to participate in that programming. And, and the department at the same time has to have that trust with the association to say, hey, we've got a guy that needs some help. And this isn't going to be part of a disciplinary. I mean, this is, I'm not talking about somebody that's committed misconduct here, okay? I'm talking about somebody that we know. And if, in policing, um, it's not uncommon for an officer to have an accident have a traffic accident, maybe they've been drinking, and for there to be three or four officers that have worked with them going, yeah, I was wondering when that was going to happen. We shouldn't have that in, in policing. I will tell you as an attorney in Illinois, uh, as a licensed attorney in Illinois, I have a hotline I can call if I'm concerned about a colleague. So if I, if I have a colleague that's practicing law and I think that they've been drinking in court, I can call an 800 number and say, hey, I'm concerned about Attorney Smith. And another attorney who has uh, recovered from an alcohol problem will contact Attorney Smith and, and work with that person. We don't have a system like that in, in law enforcement. And, and, and that's a problem. We, we need to have that. We need to have open access to, to health care for our first responders. Um, I'm going to just kind of skip through uh, a few of these with your uh, with your indulgence because I think I've covered some of it with my with my comments but I want to also leave opportunity for my co-presenter and, and for you to ask me questions um, I, I will just say that in terms of success um, and, and having these programs in place for officers I think the real key is to make sure that those things include are included in in the budget and they have their own line item in the budget uh, for, for the cities and counties that provide them. If they don't, um, then it's just a program that you could have a change in leadership and all of a sudden the next chief or the next deputy chief that's involved in this decides this isn't a priority and they do something else. If it's a lot specific line item in the budget, you got to go to the city council and explain well, why is law enforcement mental health not an issue, not a problem anymore, not something we should fund anymore. And um, I, I think that that's a real key uh, thing. It should just be part of it and, and kind of part of the cost of doing business. From a risk management standpoint, we know it makes a lot of sense because officers who are mentally well uh, don't make mistakes uh, like ones that do and, and don't commit uh, acts and, uh, like the ones that, that do have mental health issues. Um, Excuse me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Just a question, please. Are you saying that officers who have been involved in deadly force encounters have mental health issues, have a likely, a higher likelihood of mental health issues? I can't say deadly force. Uh, I can't say in, in deadly force, but there's a, a good amount of research that has shown officers who have um, habitual discipline problems, officers who are involved in more uses of force, um, oftentimes do have, there is an outside intervening uh, illness there, and I hate to say illness, but mental health issue there. That can be as a result of trauma that they've experienced as an officer. Um, you know, officers come just like everybody else. Uh, when they come into the profession, they don't, they're not a blank slate. We have officers, and there's, there's actually specific programs now for officers who are leaving military service that have been deployed overseas to, to go through PTSD uh, counseling prior to starting at the police academy. So, I mean, there are a number of issues there. 
Um, but I, I don't want to say that that like there ha as far as I know, I haven't seen any research specifically on um, deadly encounters and linking that to mental health. But there are more, more globally, we know that that's the case. That there are officers who have mental health issues um, uh, of some kind that tend to be more involved in, in use of force, more involved in, in the disciplinary process within police departments. Um, ask a quick question. Yes, sir. You mentioned a moment ago about how, as a lawyer, um, you have the opportunity in Illinois, you have the opportunity to go to a, a website or get help as a lawyer or actually either refer a colleague to that um, service as well. I'm happy to report in Minnesota we actually have a similar um, program for lawyers. It's called Lawyer, Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, and it's not only for lawyers, but for judges, it's for law students and their immediate family. I guess my question is, is there, are you aware of any state or police department that has a similar resource for police officers around the country? I'm not. Not one? Not one. And, and by the way, it, it, it's not just lawyers. There's, these exist in the medical community as well for right. doctors. So, I mean, there are other professions that do have this. But, no, I'm not, a, I'm not aware of any that have uh, that type of system in place. Yeah. Um, I have no doubt, you know, the dis your discussion about the resources for officers and, the, and how it can benefit their mental health having those support networks without it being consistent across the nation is there any research that talks about what the impact of these types of programs have on the delivery of services to the community, aside from the benefit to the officers and help the officers making better decisions, as there's been research that talks about the delivery, and this may be something we want to even touch on? Yeah, I think if you, um, and I, I mean, I don't want to step on your testimony, Chief, um, but I think if you look in the recommendations report and the case studies report, um, included in those is, is lit review. And there are studies um, referenced in both of those that would support uh, would support what you're saying, which is that if officers are healthier, they provide better service to the public. They interact in a more healthy way with the public. That they tend to de-escalate uh, more, um, um, and, and those kind of things. So yes, long answer to a yes or maybe a yes or no question. Well, that's, that's the information. Um, you know, I think the, the big takeaway in terms of, of this topic, at least for these reports, and I would encourage you to, to look at them uh, and, and read them uh, entirely, but, um, you know, there's no one great way to do this. There's no perfect way to do this. Different things are going to work in different jurisdictions. Um, but um, I think, you know, one of the key phrases that you hear talked about today is this idea of, of resiliency. And, um, you know, I don't think anyone would argue policing is difficult work. And our first responders, and particularly police officers who tend to be the first of the first responders, are exposed to a lot. Um, they're exposed to things, uh, to seeing things, and, and frankly having to do things. Um, and I'm not, specific, I'm not <coughs> talking about use of force here, but, but just in terms of responding to accidents where uh, you know, uh, traffic accidents where perhaps a child has been severely injured or killed uh, or, or someone else. Um, those things take a toll. And um, that's not an issue for debate. We know they take a toll. We know that the trauma, exposure to trauma takes a toll. Um, and, and that is solidly supported uh, by medical and scientific research. And the issue is, you know, are, are we giving our officers everything we can in terms of teaching them about that because just because you're exposed doesn't mean you'll develop some kind of disorder if you know how to deal with the exposure and you have ways of dealing with it with professionals you can totally get past it like you can totally deal with it and, and, and move on uh, at least most people can and, and that's backed up by, uh, by research too so um, I think the key thing is to we need to start training officers in resiliency from the day they're hired, uh, and we need to make sure that they are continuing that in service until the day they retire and after. Um, I promised you um, we would put this up. Um, this is the um, DOJ website where you can get both of these reports. Um, 
I, I tend to think the one in, with the red cover is a little bit better because you know I helped write it. But uh, in all seriousness, uh, both of them are excellent uh, resources, and uh, I would commend them to your uh, state and local law enforcement agencies as well if they're interested in setting up uh, a mental health program for their officers or testing to see if theirs is is adequate. These are good places to start. Thank you. Hugh Colson. Just give me a quick second here, Commissioner, please, so that I can have this up and running for you. Good morning, uh, co-chairs and uh, distinguished co-chairs and members of the work group. Uh, I'm Mike Goldstein. I'm the Director of Public Safety and Police Chief for the City of Plymouth, and it's my honor to be here today. Um, I have, I was told I have about 30 minutes to cram a 90-minute presentation into, and I'm going to do my very best to do that. Much of it will um, dovetail on what my co-presenter offered to you this morning as well. Just as a bit of background, I've been in law enforcement. I'm in my 29th year, almost 30th year, and 15 years plus as uh, the police chief for our community. I'm also an adjunct faculty member at the University of St. Thomas. And today, throughout my testimony, I'm gonna be wearing some different hats that I'll explain when I get to the different key points because of some work that I've been doing uh, with some research scientists as it relates to officer wellness and resiliency. So with that, um, I think it's important, and I, I know that all of you received a copy of the abstract of what I'd be talking about today. And my purpose uh, is certainly to answer questions that you might have, but to provide you know all of us a practical approach for the support, establishment, and ongoing maintenance of a comprehensive wellness and training programs for public safety professionals that are predicated on you know irrefutable data. I have a absolute passion for this work. And it's my hope to help inspire and motivate others to either replicate uh, what we're doing in our organization or what's being done in other venues across the state and the country uh, to best help those that uh, protect our communities. Um, in my work, I've been lucky enough to have been published on a few different things. Uh, the media has captured some of our work. NPR just did a, a very nice story on our organization a couple of weeks ago. And I have done work for the IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and the National League of Cities um, as it relates to wellness opportunities for organizations and their personnel. And I also do chair a subcommittee for the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association on wellness. The idea today is to talk about the need, is it fact or fiction, uh, to talk a little bit about servant leadership the 21st Century Policing Task Force report and uh, offering what, from my perspective, what a comprehensive approach might be to best care for those that serve our communities and then to offer some future recommendations. Moreover, my hope is that we learn something new together today and that we're able to put it into practice and then derive some shared success um, that these efforts might generate. Uh, I want to help set the stage, uh, and I think my co-presenter um, offered some excellent testimony related to this, but we are in law enforcement and primarily the 24-7 social scientists, more so de facto social scientists, in that when people call 911, they're not calling us with good news. You know, no one calls 911 to say, hey, I got promoted today, I just thought I would share that, right? That's not why they call. They call when they have a problem, and as a result, law enforcement officers and other first responders are there to problem solve. And in that process, we might be chemical health specialists, we might be behavioral health specialists, we might be social workers, we might be guardians, 
We might be educators, we might be lifesavers, and we might be enforcers. We wear many, many hats. And I think we do a lot of things really incredibly well. Some would argue that there's some things that we do that we shouldn't do, and I might agree with that. Uh, sometimes we're called into situations that might exceed our capabilities, our training, and, and our expertise. But who else is going to be <coughs> doing that at 2 in the morning? We don't have another set of services necessarily at the ready to go out and manage these different calls for service. So while we have what we have and we know it's not perfect, um, it is still pretty good. But we know that we have to work on a path towards continuous improvement in order to help make things better. And I think that if you look at what has occurred over the course of time, um, never before has law enforcement been better trained or educated or more aware of the social concerns that are dynamic. Um, and as such, we try to be more engaged with community policing and committed to doing the right things at the right time. And I think Minnesota leads the way across the nation as it relates to the educational requirements that we have for police officers and the training requirements that we have for police officers, including mandated training on de-escalation, implicit bias, cultural competency. Uh, that doesn't happen everywhere. It happens here and that's, I think, special and it's good for Minnesota. But we're missing a huge component that I hope to help illustrate here today. Uh, when we talk about finding continuous ways to improve how we deliver service to the community, we also have to find better ways of delivering a product to our own personnel, a service to our own personnel that will help them better serve the community and help keep our communities safer. So, Law enforcement is considered one of the most dangerous, stressful, and health-threatening occupations. It's been proven time and time again as we compare what law enforcement does uh, in relation to other occupations uh, throughout either the social science fields or in other uh, occupations um, uh, in our society. In 2011, a study found that 98% of law enforcement agencies do not require their officers to meet physical fitness standards after being hired. And I would argue that in Minnesota, that rings very true here as well. Very few departments have requirements, ongoing requirements for physical health. The Cooper Institute conducted a comprehensive assessment of 1,700 law enforcement officers across the U.S. and found them to have a lower than average fitness level as compared to the general population based on aerobic fitness, strength, and body fat. Now I have some other data uh, to reinforce that in a moment. And we know that when people are not fit, bad things can happen to them with their physical health, let alone their mental health. And just so we all understand that if one of our personnel go out with uh, an injury on duty related to a heart attack, uh, it's a four hundred to seven hundred fifty thousand dollar cost to the organization. The effects of job stress are well studied and include increased levels of psychological disorders such as anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress, and physiological conditions including hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and other metabolic diseases. In Scotland, for example, more than two hundred thousand days of work has been lost due to mental ill health in the last four years alone. And the reason for the absences include anxiety, depression, insomnia, and post-traumatic stress. And if you, you know, put dollars to those lost days of work, it's significant. More locally, here in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, 67,000 hours of work time were lost to sick officers or those injured on duty in 2017 resulting in approximately $2.7 million in overtime and workers' compensation-related costs. And that's with Chief Aaron Dondo's police department. And he is just representative of one department throughout our entire state. This is what I think I hope you find interesting and a bit disconcerting. In Minnesota, disability retirements for both physical and psychological injuries for police officers has risen from 128 between 09 and 12 to 240 between 2013 and 2016. And in red, you see 194, and that's as of August of 2019. So the number will certainly be higher than that as the year comes to an end. 
And most striking is the increase in disability retirements for psychological injuries, which rose from 27 retirements, you know, seven years ago or so, to 70 retirements four years ago, to already 91 retirements in the last couple of years. And again, that's only through August of 2019. Post-traumatic stress claims since 2013 in Minnesota alone have a total cost of $14.7 million in incurred uh, claim costs. And this is from you know, public employment through the League of Minnesota Cities. This is their information to me. And it should be inter you know, shocking, concerning, um, that 14.6 million of that 14.7 is directly related to public safety personnel going out with IOD claims related to post-traumatic stress. And if you look at, you know, further down the line, um, between 12 and 15, 6% of all police work comp claim costs were related to post-traumatic stress. Well, now that's jumped to 28. And over this uh, last year, right, in the first six months of 2019, the total net incurred costs for post-traumatic stress claims rose 49% between the first of the year and June 30th of this year. $2.1 million new claims and 2.9 uh, was due to the development of existing claims. So we're spending a lot of money and we don't have a lot of answers as to how to better protect our personnel and to protect the financial resources that impact our cities and the insurance trusts that protect our cities and on the retirement system that our officers rely on. I'm not gonna go through these, but um, you can go and you know, do a search on post-traumatic stress, suicide-related issues, mental health-related issues, physical health-related issues, just over the last month, and you will come up with story after story after story, making national headlines or certainly state headlines, particularly in New York, where they've lost 10 or more police officers to suicide, uh, and Chicago last year had devastating suicide results as well. We know that um, law enforcement officers um, have a higher incidence of substance abuse as compared to the general population. We know that they are sleep deprived, which causes a whole host of psycho and physiological concerns and disease. We know that many of them are obese. We know that some deal with chronic pain, whether it's psychological pain or physical pain or both. We know that the incidence of divorce or domestic uh, con conflictual relations uh, or conflicted relationships um, uh, are greater than the general population. We know that their psychological injuries, whether it's depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, as I've highlighted, is greater than the general population. Suicide, as Mr. Smoot talked about, is um, off the charts, and, it's, and, and it is actually rising for um, all uh, interested parties in society, um, but specific to law enforcement too. And we know that our morbidity and mortality rates exceed that of the general population. Uh, John Violanti, who is probably the grandfather of all law enforcement research as it relates to stress out of Buffalo University in New York, in a study that he did showed that police officers die on average 21 years ahead of the general population. Now, his study to me was limited to population on the East Coast. I would not want to extrapolate that across the country. I don't think that that's necessarily true in the Midwest, but it is thought-provoking. The National Opinion Research Center out of the University of Chicago is doing a study on law enforcement officer safety and wellness. It's a multi-level study directed by Dr. Elizabeth Mumford, who I've had the opportunity to talk with. Uh, PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum, John Violanti, who I already mentioned, along with Brian Vila, um, or Viola, excuse me, uh, these preeminent sort of uh, researchers are, uh, have, have um, conducted this study that supports what I've just uh, suggested here, that law enforcement officers experience long-term health, morbidity and mortality rates exceeding other occupations and the general population. For example, they have found that a third of the departments across the country, and these are preliminary results of their study, I do need to qualify that, where they've looked at over 2,000 police departments, a third of those have cut or have reduced or have postponed wellness and safety programming due to budget cuts, budget concerns, or staffing issues. 
We know that through their um, uh, preliminary results as they were looking at the general population. Uh, when you survey and screen the general population, about 30% will say that they are in good to excellent health. What they found through this study nationwide as it relates to police officers is less than 10% are in good or excellent health. When you look at mental health disorders, anxiety or depression, um, the, the incidence of, of, of concern and, and uh, the impact it's having on public safety folks is almost twice as high as compared to the general population and PTSD as compared to the rest of the population is three times as high. Um, another example here that I believe that leads to the next point on leadership is that I believe we all have a moral and ethical obligation to look at this issue. And I believe that if we don't, we're being deliberately indifferent, which leads to negligence, which then leads to court findings. A case out of the District of Columbia found that due to the officer's lack of physical fitness, the officer was unable to use less harmful defense tactics and reported and resorted, excuse me, to using his firearm, causing the subject to become paraplegic. The verdict was that the DC Metro Police Department was found to be deliberately indifferent in how they were dealing with officers and their physical fitness issues. So really the crux of this is um, we either pay now or pay later, and we pay on different levels, all kinds of levels. I'm not just talking about the financial costs. So it's time for a different leadership philosophy. As Mr. Smooth talked about, we bring in people with different backgrounds, different degrees of experience, life experience, but typically they come in pretty healthy. And then we throw them into an arena, kind of a front row seat to humanity, where they get to see and do things that are honorable, that are needed, that are important, but are very, very difficult. And they don't just do it once or twice. They do it again and again and again over 30 years, the typical lifespan of a police officer. And then we throw them out into retirement. We wish them the best. And that leads to a whole host of issues that, again, I hope I've highlighted sufficiently for you. So the question is, do we want to perpetuate a vicious cycle or do we want to create a virtuous cycle by doing something new and different? I subscribe to the servant leadership philosophy. Uh, this is a quote from somebody else, not mine, but a servant leader is a person of character who puts people first, who is a skilled communicator, a compassionate collaborator, who possesses foresight, is a systems thinker, and leads with moral authority. And as a servant leader, I do put people first. That is my main purpose and my role. And a leader must exhibit fairness and civility at all costs when dealing with an organization's most important assets, and that's its personnel. That's my job. Take care of our women and men, who then will take care of the community, and collectively, we meet our mission by doing that. There's an old military adage that says, you know, you must take care of your troops if you want to carry out your mission. And I don't know that we're doing that all that great. Uh, across the state or beyond the state. Mr. Smooth talked about early warning systems that have been put in place to look at use of incidents, use of force incidents, sick time use, crashes, um, tardiness issues, other behavioral issues to kind of see if red flags pop up where there can be an earlier intervention to try to help officers through whatever they might be going through. And it might not be work related. It could be stuff going on at home or elsewhere in their lives. This is a cultural shift. It's not a program, it's not a tactic, it's not even a, a more comprehensive strategy. It's building a new culture into the organizations that we all um, lead and that we expect um, you know, to provide the very best to our personnel so they can provide the very best to our communities. And I think the 21st Century Policing Report identified how to best do that. This is an incredibly influential document. And the authors of this report and the women and men that came together, the professionals within academia and within the public safety sector that came forward to work on this were very deliberate in what they did. They created six pillars that many organizations across the country were already doing or exceeding. But for as many who were doing great things, there were many who were doing not so great things that had their head in the sand. 
And this document is sort of that barometer, right? This um, common denominator for organizations to compare themselves against and to try to reach and strive for. And the sixth pillar that talks about officer wellness and safety, and I, a lot of times we, we, we turn those two terms around. We talk about officer safety and wellness, and I think the authors were deliberate and smart about putting wellness first, because if your cops aren't well, they're not gonna be safe. And, they, and their quote here is, the bulletproof cop does not exist. The officers who protect us must also be protected against the incapacitating physical, mental, and emotional health problems, as well as against the hazards of the job. I had the opportunity to meet with faith leaders from North Minneapolis a few years ago, <clears throat> working with Andy Luger, our former U.S. attorney. And in talking with them, uh, a fairly prominent uh, faith leader um, spoke up and he said, you know, um, we need the police, we want the police, we hope that they're doing good work, but the police in my neighborhood are broken. No offense, Chief, this was just a comment that he was making, that the police in my neighborhood are broken, and as a result, we get broken services. And so I'm giving him credit for the, you know, sort of the, the, the paraphrase quotation, broken cops equal broken services we have to do a better job. And how do we do that? And this leads me to my next point of creating a comprehensive approach. We know that stress exists, internal stress, external stress. We know that, um, that you know, using Gordon Graham, who is uh, known to those of us in public safety, a, a national uh, speaker, talks about, you know, what's predictable is preventable. This stuff is predictable. We know that the stress that officers are going to endure is gonna have an effect on their performance. And so what can we do to mitigate the negative effects that um, it can have? Predictable is preventable. We have to do a better job. So this comprehensive approach that I have been advocating for as a chief for my organization or elsewhere when I've been asked to come and present is to one again acknowledge the reality, understand the statistics, the empirical data. It's not going to go away and you can't sugarcoat it. We have to acknowledge the stress that exists within our society and within our own organizations that our officers have to deal with. We then have to come up with a, a marketing plan, if you will, to help generate support, community support, support from our city councils, our city administrators, our unions, right? And that's what we did in Plymouth we put together this comprehensive approach over the last seven years to generate some success here. We brought in national speakers to set the stage. We created a department policy as it relates to wellness. We actually established wellness officers, um, just like departments have range officers and defensive tactics officers and field training officers. We have wellness officers that have specialized training to go out and help coach and mentor our officers. We actually looked at the issue of suicide and talked about it very blatantly and incorporated that into a line of duty death within our own department policy. And again, we have been proactive in aligning ourselves through either retainer or employment relationships with physicians. We actually have a physician on staff. Mental health uh, providers, we have uh, a mental health provider on retainer and spiritual health. We're, we're not afraid to talk about that. And we're not there to proselytize. We're not there to promote one religion over another. It's just about understanding that there's something greater than you in providing the services that we provide. But I'd really like to focus on the mental health piece because that, I think, uh, speaks to um, the greater tenor of what today might bring as others come and talk to you um, with their ideas and recommendations going forward. Um, like Mr. Smoot talked about in Indianapolis, I believe he said they have a mentoring program. We, we have established that too. And it's outside of the field training process that officers have. They're assigned a mentor to help them navigate their way through the first few years of their career to keep them on track and focused and healthy. Um, and that has evolved into an emerging peer support program that I won't get into right now, but that is a very prominent uh, offering that organizations have, and I do support the idea of protecting those conversations through legislative action that our Minnesota Government Data Practices Act would need to be adjusted to, um, uh, to, to, to make happen. 
we talk about, you know, at our in-service training, we talk about mindfulness and we talk about sleep and diet and, and other uh, physical ailments by bringing in our specialists to come and talk to our officers. After critical incidents, we have stress debriefings and defusings, like most organizations do today. It's just a common practice and it's a good practice. We uh, have partnered with the Concerns of Police Survivors to send our wellness officers to their advanced training so that we are in tune with what's going on nationally along with the studies that Mr. Smoot talked about. In our own internal academy, we start them out day one by talking about mental, physical, and spiritual health. And we reinforce that through communications throughout the year and throughout one's career. We talk about financial fitness as well, that was brought up earlier. And we bring in families with this and we, we, we talk about how to keep people healthy in that regard as well. And the one that I really want to focus on is check up for the neck up. And this is the one that has attracted a lot of attention um, that many other departments now across the state are starting to replicate. Um, and I'm capable of no original thought. Uh, this is stuff that I have picked up from others across the country but we had, uh, I heard of an idea uh, out of North Carolina where a department was paying a mental health therapist to provide a once a year check-in for officers to go in and just sort of dump whatever toxins they were carrying. And I thought, well, if it's good for them, it's gotta be good for us. So we found a mental health provider, uh, put them on retainer, and as a part of that relationship, uh, there it's kind of a soft on-call if we ever have a critical incident for them to come also provide in-service training and for our officers to go visit with him for at least once at least once per year to talk about whatever it is that they want to talk about and I really don't care what they talk about they can talk about the Minnesota Twins clinching the division um, I just want them to establish a relationship with this provider so that if the day should come where they really need to talk about someone they have that established relationship but I know that those conversations go deeper than what I just sort of used as an example and we did this as a voluntary process, and we had few people using it. And then we had two officer-involved shootings six months apart from each other. And they were tragic events for everybody involved. And as a result of those tragic events, we lost two of our officers to post-traumatic stress early retirements. And I said, we're not doing enough. As progressive as I thought we were, we're not doing enough. So we worked with the union to compel, to mandate the check-ins. And the union, agreed with some uh, caveats to the process. Um, and right now, everybody in our organization from the top down meets with a mental health therapist each year. And we've been doing it the last two years running. So the data is anecdotal at this point, but the outcomes so far have been good. And we have officers addressing needs that have come out through those conversations through longer term therapies that probably never would have been addressed in a healthy way. Um, and they have been open about that. They have been the ones sharing their experiences with their peers and even with me as an, as an administrator about how this helped um, enlighten them to some help that they really needed. And that's a good thing because they're healthier and they're doing a better job for our community. So other departments are looking at this and the idea here is that there really isn't a stigma when everybody has to do it. Now again, those conversations need to be properly protected can't be used as retribution uh, for officers if they're struggling in the field. But again, it's something that we're proud of and I just wanted this workshop, or uh, working group, excuse me, to know and understand. Wearing a different hat because of my passion related to this outside of my daytime job, I have affiliated myself um, with a group of research scientists and we conducted a study in 2019, uh, to the end of 18 into 2019, um, that is comprehensive and unique. And um, it's looking at how can we best optimize performance when officers are under stress that will reduce the incidence of post-traumatic stress and long-term health concerns. And this uh, study was led and affirmed by a leading academic research scientist from Washington State University, Dr. Lois James, and it was funded through the League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust. And the study, um, again, the goal was to reduce the risk of post-traumatic stress and other conditions while optimizing performance under stress using biometric feedback. And I was just in Washington, D.C. last week talking about our study 
along with others who are doing similar work with the Police Executive Research Forum, the RAND Corporation, and the National Institute of Justice. Because this is an emerging technology that is a game changer. It truly is. We know through our study that we can establish personalized stress indexes or indices. Um, and by doing so, we can help condition folks on an individual or personalized manner to improve their performance when they're dealing with stressful incidents. And as a result, we can broaden sort of their um, boundaries as far as what they can work themselves through without being either hypo or hyper vigilant. Because when people are in those two states of mind, bad things can result. Poor decisions can be made. When you talk about, and I don't want to get too much into the science, but the parasympathetic or the sympathetic response to things, we react to the sympathetic side when we're under stress and things are happening very rapidly. But through the right conditioning, we can get people to think through things a little bit more clearly and to use other tactics and techniques, maybe to, again, manage an incident differently, more effectively, more promising. There is no panacea, right? There will be deadly force encounters, no matter how well people are trained and how healthy they are. But I do think we can reduce some of these incidences along with the use of force through the proper coaching, training, and conditioning. And from that study, it has led to some work that I'm doing with a large healthcare organization um, to provide a whole new set of services for folks that can't support these programs. Either their organizations don't have the resources or they don't have you know, the capacity to take some of these programs on. We believe that we can do more with more studies. We know that the military has done a great deal of work as it relates to using biometric feedback as to who they put into combat and who they don't. We think that there's an opportunity to use this technology in the academy setting and certainly in service settings once folks are hired. And again, I think we can create safer communities as a result. Our manuscript will be done actually on Monday and it will be um, out for publication thereafter and I hope to share more with this group once that happens. As I conclude, I want to offer a couple of different recommendations. Again, I believe this is a call to action. We either pay now or pay later as a society. I think that we need to generate greater statewide awareness and we need to do so using empirical data, not just you know um, anecdotal stories. We need to devise and share evidence-based wellness and training programs, again, both pre-service and in-service considerations here. And we need to fund development and programming through grant options, preferably monies appropriated through our own legislature. As there are federal grants that are available through NIH, NIJ, DOJ, but they're cumbersome and they're typically reserved for large agencies. Mid-sized departments, smaller departments, they don't get to take advantage of these uh, grants because they're just too difficult to manage their way through. And I think through the Department of Public Safety here in Minnesota or somewhere else, there could be money set aside um, that departments could apply for grants, either you know a cost share, um, sort of a matching grant, or just an all-out grant to help provide some of these services, uh, utilizing you know vetted qualified professional resources. And then conduct analyses going forward to assess the benefits and the outcomes of this programming. On behalf of you know the Minnesota Chiefs who I'm representing in the city of Plymouth today as well, along with the work that I'm doing with this research, um, this is a, a, a little slide that we used to use in different talks about overall wellness where we're talking about physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional. Um, I wanted to help make you folks aware of what's going on. I think we can train better people to be better at what they do. And again, as I said for the 10th time, through this action, I think we can create safer communities for all. And as a final quote here, as John Adams once answered to the following question, if we do all of this, will we, will we be successful? No, I can't assure success, but I can assure you that you will deserve success for making this effort. My references are attached along with my contact information and I 
stand for any questions that you might have, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Chair? <coughs> Chair, so. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you, Chief Goldstein, uh, and uh, thank you for your leadership. I know that you have uh, represented our state well in terms of uh, peace officers, and uh, this has been clearly a stigma within our profession, sadly. Uh, this has been our dark kept secret, and uh, I appreciate you taking the lead over many years uh, talking about the importance of uh, employee officer wellness. And so, uh, just a couple of things that I uh, stood out between uh, yourself and uh, Mr. Smoot's presentation today. Um, the, the, the quote from the Reverend in North Minneapolis that if we have broken uh, peace officers, they're going to give us broken service. And I think that is that is we need to as as police leaders we need to really talk about that a, a lot more um the importance of of uh mr smooth talked about this has to be in our budget this cannot be something that uh, is a hit and miss or a one and done it, it has to be a, a clear part of our our budgets i believe as as police leaders our budgets tell our story and so i think it's very important that uh, that moves forward as well um, um we talk about the data that you've shown on PTSD. Uh, our department has been impacted by that um, too regularly. I'm signing off on separation notices uh, all the time on this. I've not seen it in my career as much as I've seen it in the last uh, five years. And um, we, we have to get our hands around that uh, somehow. Um, you mentioned also uh, overtime. And, uh, and I thank you for showing that slide as it relates to Minneapolis, because the reason why is because, and it goes back connection to sleep deprivation. Those employees of ours that are uh, acquiring that 2.7 million of overtime, well, they don't just fall from the sky. They're still working, and right. they've been adding on more hours. And I know, and you've certainly indicated this, the research shows that overworked and tired officers, yeah. it's going to lead to bad outcomes. And so um, that is something that I'm having, obviously, conversations with my elected officials uh, as well, but uh, I think this is so important. Uh, this is new for our culture in terms of just naming uh, the stress and trauma that goes with this work, and we, we must do better. And, uh, and I just appreciate you also as a leader making sure that this work sus uh, long sustains past your leadership. And so I think that's very important. Everything that you've embedded within uh, the Plymouth Police Department are certainly things that I uh, plan to do also within the MPD, but uh, just want to say I appreciate both your your uh, comments regarding this matter. Thank you, Chief. Sir, I have a question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you know, and I too, I, I certainly echo what the Chief uh, said in terms of bringing this forward. Uh, we know that, you know, officer wellness, especially for our community, is really critical. You know, we want healthy officers patrolling and policing, you know, our communities because we want, you know, healthy, thriving communities. And so uh, I just have a couple questions just in terms of like process. Sure. Um, so you said, so I got two questions, so I'll, I'll ask them kind of serial. Um, so one of the questions that I had was um, in terms of the conditioning um, and increasing um, in that wellness index, uh, who, who is, who's overseeing um, that process? Um, how, did the, how did they get sourced out? Um, to, to go from wherever that baseline is to um, putting processes in place to increase that. So who's overseeing that, that conditioning piece that you said? Yeah, so that, okay. So uh, that was a part of the study, right? And with that, um, that's, it was a scientific study where, where there's a, a review board that oversees any time you deal with human beings and any sort of study like that, there's a lot of very, um, particular pieces that have to fall into place, it's highly regulated. And so we had um, 40 officers from 10 different departments with varying degrees of experience come in over a three month period whereby they were wearing a certain device where we were measuring various um, biometrics, biometrics, excuse me, um, looking for um, their general sort of regular pattern of where they, where they typically operate within and then by inducing stress, watching what happens to their decision-making process when those param uh, parameters are being exceeded, right? Their normal parameters are being exceeded. So did this happen in field or no. was this? It was all in a simulated setting um, over the course of a three-month time. 
and then we would work on different interventions to coach them and train them so that they could um, use those interventions during uh, a stressful encounter to keep them sort of in balance. And so this is something that we believe can be taken into a training environment. Uh, there will be a time where there will be real-time feedback where information will be coming back to an officer on their watch or somewhere else. It already exists, but in a more uh, sophisticated way to help people stay within their margins. Um, but the, the, there's a lot of data practices issues related to that, et cetera. So to answer your question, that was a part of the study um, that we think can be extrapolated into the greater environment in both the academy and then in service, uh, utilizing probably a third party. We would pay someone to send our officers to go to, to train them, uh, because if that information was known within the organization, you might have some potential data practices issues as it relates to health data. So, and it's a long answer to your no, question. No, 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 that, that answer. And then I guess it takes me to the second question, because I'm thinking in terms of like practicality and how something like this could be implemented like on a larger scale right. for like like the city of Minneapolis or the city of St. Paul. Um, and then the, the second question that kind of takes me into that, and that was, you said the union said um, yes, but. And yep. so what, what was some of, what was some of the, um, the caveats? Um, just Thanks for asking. So as it relates, for check -up, as it relates to checkup for the neck up, uh, the union understood the purpose. They didn't, uh, you know, they weren't too uh, concerned about what outcome we were trying to achieve. But the thought was, we're compelling everybody to go to the same person. And they came to us and said, we have some members that already have somebody. So can they go to see them instead of the person that the department has put on retainer? And the answer was yes. As long as it's a qualified mental health professional that is properly licensed, go. Um, and so the checkup for the neck up program for our officers, they're, they do it on duty, so they're being paid. It's done in a comfortable setting. Everyone has to go. And if you choose not to go to our person, they can go to their own. Um, and if it's during the day and we can accommodate it, we'll send them on duty. If not, well, then they have to go on their own. Uh, and it's, it, and, and no information comes back to me. All I get is a count at the end of the year that all 80 police officers went. That's all I get. Um, and the only time that I believe the professionals would notify our HR department is if they believe that the officer was a threat to themselves or to somebody else, then that would trigger a whole other set of circumstances. Um, but that has not occurred. Um, and it's done confidentially. The union has, you know, agreed to it as long as we stay within the lane that we uh, have identified, and so far, so good. And if I could just say, that that's the same standard that would be used it, for if somebody went to their own doctor, if the doctor thought that they posed a harm to themselves or a threat to themselves or someone else, the doctor would be able to breach that confidentiality that's already included in the law, so it's not like an added protection. Chief Goldstein and uh, Mr. Smoot, we want to thank both of you. Uh, if there are other questions, I would... The problem is, is that we have family members here, and uh, I'd like to get give them an opportunity. Uh, so, um, uh, of course, the questions that we have of, of, of you are critically important, too. I want to alert members that we do have another uh, witness to talk about officer wellness as well. And, but at, at this time, just because of families uh, traveling, and uh, we're going to we're going to move to that segment. So we do want to thank you, you both for your excellent testimony, and I'm sure that other members want to follow up with you as well. But uh, this time I'm going to ask family members to, to come forward. Uh, I, I know that there's a few families who are here, uh, and so as um, uh, soon as the officers, uh, as soon as the chief. Oh, I know, you take your time, man. I'm not rushing you, um, but thanks again.
sure. So I'm aware that we have at least three, maybe even four different families here. Um, so I would just ask you to come forward uh, if possible. Um, I, I am aware that uh, Mr. Don Damon is present with us today. I don't know if he wants to make any comment, but just want to acknowledge his presence. And I know the family of Isaac Aden and the family of uh, sure. Justin Justin uh, Tegan is here as well. Linda Galloway. And Linda G Galloway. So uh, with that, um, whoever would like to begin, uh, you have the full attention of our, the working group. If you could just introduce, say your first name and, and then begin. My name is Tashira. Um, I thank you guys for taking the time out to hear from the behalf of the families that are living out in the community after our loved ones were murdered by the police here in Minnesota. Um, I would like to say to you guys that it would be good if as leaders you guys got out into the community and heard from the community. Because a lot of times the community, uh, the family members have different narratives than what the police have in the newspaper, have in the media, and have reported. We have totally different narratives. Um, we are treated different than what's put out into the newspapers and things of that nature. So uh, we are the experts on what needs to change because we are living through what has been done to our loved ones. Um, I will say this, there are a, hundreds of families that are out in the community suffering from what the police have done. All of these murders are not because they were afraid. How are you afraid if someone is running away from you? Um, all of these murders are not because someone had a mental health situation happening at the time. Um, there has been hundreds of murders that have been covered up and different stories have been put out into the community. So if you guys get out into primarily the poor and the African American communities, you will hear different stories than what you will get from your t scientific studies. Um, just get out in the community and talk to the people for yourself and you will hear a different narrative. And then I also So just this year alone, there's been over 20 deaths uh, just in the state of Minnesota, and the year's not even over. So watching all these presentations about seeing all the resources that has been provided to the officers, I didn't see anything mentioned about the family. Um, the family is, I would say, the most important part throughout this whole situation because if officers are, like many people have been saying, overweight, um, they're not passing their physical training, and a family member has to suffer because of that, and they're not getting any help. That is a huge problem that we have to address because these officers are still on paid administrative leave while my whole family is on un, uh, unpaid administrative leave to fight and get public information under state law that is we're required to receive that we're not getting. So. There's nothing in place to help the families, to help the victims, and all I'm hearing is how can we help these officers. Um, there's no accountability in place. There's no resources for the families. The only resources the family has is other family members and nonprofit organizations that, um, although they, can, they financially can't help support the family because we're, on, we're, we're not getting paid through our employers, we're paying for expenses through our funerals. We're paying for independent autopsies. So we're, 
putting out a lot of money to just get basic information and all that can be solved with releasing the body camera footage, re releasing public data. We're wasting our time screaming and yelling in public, waking up early in the morning on a Saturday to go protest because we're not getting b our basic rights. We literally had to protest multiple times to get personnel files of the officers involved in my brother's death. For those of you guys that, know, that don't know, personnel file, files are public information and every single person in the state of Minnesota can request and access personnel files of the officers. But it took us over two months and multiple protests just to get that information. Are the two um, guys that spoke here in the room right now? Yes. So everything you've completely said, I'm not gonna say excuse my language because I'm not gonna allow you guys to police that, but Everything you said was complete bullshit. Complete bullshit. Um, surgeons that don't qualify to be surgeons are not allowed to do surgery on patients. So why are officers who aren't qualified, who don't meet these standards on the job? If you say there are broken officers, they provide broken services, what services are there for these families that are traumatized by that police? What resources are there? Instead of asking how can we help these officers, they're the cause of the trauma. They're the cause of our trauma. Yeah. Now I'm a 21 year old. I was a 21 year old out of state college student who had a 3.929 GPA. Who, and now I'm a 21 year old who is a college dropout who has, who has depression PTSD and anxiety because officers, police officers, murdered my brother. What resources are there for me? So all I see, I'm going to speak up because none of you are. You're all police apologists. Nobody asks, nobody asks, what can we, what services are there for families? What about the trauma that these broken officers, what, what services are there for these families? They, these people who have these broken interactions with these broken police officers. All I'm hearing is, oh, the officer was broken. So of course, he's, you're, you're justifying his actions. You're normalizing this. I didn't want me and my brother to come and speak on this after we got an invitation to because of the email, because of what it said. Deadly force encounters by, you're normalizing police brutality Murder. by your language. We didn't lose our brother to gun violence, we lost it to police misconduct and police violence. You're normalizing it. Instead of this working group on police brutality, it's not working when you're using language to normalize this behavior, to normalize this action, to confidently say it will keep happening. Isn't this supposed to be a working group to stop it? You're normalizing it. You're not doing anything to stop it. What credibility do any of you have? The language you're using. How can we help these officers? These officers are suffering. We're suffering. We're children. I had to drop out of school. I am now a statistic. My brother was a statistic. Who was a, he was a college student, a business owner, and a banker who took care of his three younger siblings and his grandmother. He was from everything. He worked, he was a model citizen, and he was a statistic because he couldn't make it to 25. There is a cycle. You didn't just kill him and it ended there. Now it's taking a toll on us. It's stopping us from being successful. Instead of asking what resources are there to help these officers, fuck them. Fuck them, they knew, the car. they knew that when they stepped onto the job. And then on top of that, you, you talked about uh, military men who um, later on joined the police force. First of all, the, the police force is already over-militarized. Second of all, the, uh, one of the officers that killed my brother was a former uh, military man. He came back, joined the police force. He joined Bloomington Police Department. His name is Anthony Keel. He joined Bloomington Police Department killed a man in 2015, 
and then has killed my brother again. These are first time offenders, these are serial killers. Whatever you're doing, the, so the sources you're providing to them are obviously not working. They're not working. That mental examination that he had before he joined the police force was not working. Whatever you guys did after that, you're, by normalizing their behavior and their actions, you're allowing this to continue to happen. You're allowing those officers to continue to be broken. You're allowing their, their actions, their emotions, and their mental state affect the rest of the community that they're supposed to be serving and protecting. This working group is police, is full of police apologists. And you come on here, you expect us to sit here and listen to everybody, literally everybody, talk about what can we do to help these officers. You invite families to panels like this and tell them to listen to conversations about how we can help the police officers, how we can help the police officers. What about our trauma? Do we not matter? And they protect their own unless they're black, Muslim, Somali, and an immigrant. feel like being here today. I'm having surgery done on my mouth. This is a good call, and I have to be here. Jaffer, life matters. Jaffer was a father, a husband, a brother, a nephew. He was something to a lot of us. I mean, Jaffer loved children. Children. Just 
start from this. I mean, his own family set of children, set of children, were destroyed by this. My family, devastated by this. Jafford, Jafford had a son. He had a wife. He had a grandbaby came right after he died. Jefford was shot up, and police pushed him under the rug, but didn't nobody know. When they shot him, they left him outside with his pants pulled down to his foot for a whole day and night, where people took pictures of his body and put it on Facebook, and I had to see that. They're no longer normal. We will never be normal again. We just have to keep moving on the way we are. We, sh we, had we shouldn't have went through what we went through. The BCA beat my door down to come and, and brag to me about it. No one want to get that beat on that door. brother was a police and he made detectives for the police department. I have three nephews that are police. I have police in Chicago, police in Mississippi, police everywhere. I know how policing goes. Don't go like this. Homicide is a crime. Family that I come from has never committed a a crime like that in their lives. The family of police that I come from has profession. They are professional. The great professionalism. This is not policing. My family member never killed anyone because of the crime. They had training. Not your kind of training. See, your training. Is training to kill. They didn't. They weren't trained like that. They were disciplined. If they thought about something like that, the chief wasn't going. So I know your chiefs can do something about this. Because, and I know the state can do something about this. It's only what you allow. There's no there's no accountability. And you know what? One of the police that shot my son had killed before. Because there's no accountability, they're going to keep killing. They're destroying families. Post-traumatic stress is coming out of this. Bipolar disorder is coming out of this. There are a lot of many mental illnesses coming out of this. In our neighborhood, we don't deserve this. No. We're law-abiding citizens. We don't deserve this. And no wonder people are jumping out of cars running at the police for nine and stuff because mental illness, mental is, illness coming out of this. is coming people out of this. Are, it, it's only a matter of time before people will start to retaliate back. When you keep pushing people and pushing people and pushing people and brutalizing the community, people are going to start to strike back. And that's what investigate.
take the police and their police that are doing the same thing, killing. There have been 400 reported murders that we have, and that's only reported. I know two other families that have not reported their murders uh, that they have in the state of Minnesota since the year 2000. So all 400 of those murders, the person, and most of these uh, killings are minority and poor people. Yeah. So all of these murders, the person was wrong, the person attacked the police. Like, come Why on. Why are our family being demonized for being killed? Can anybody answer that? Why? Why should his family even be de demonized and harassed? When you killed our children, we didn't kill yours. And there's a reason why they never release autopsy photos. We always see the body camera footage, we always hear what happens, but nobody really sees what happens to the body except for the family. That's why we're mad, that's why we're angry. I had to watch my brother's body at the autopsy table. I had to count so the bullets. I could see his organs through the poorly stitched autopsy. Mm -hmm. I was literally at the table seeing my brother's organs through his chest. If you guys don't know, the Islamic religion doesn't allow the body to be mutilated after it's dead. So we tried anything <coughs> possible to make sure that autopsy didn't happen. We didn't care if we were gonna get money out of it, we didn't care even if it was going to lock up the offices. Our goal was to make sure our brother has a proper burial. We were denied that, and there was no we information were. communicated to us. We were told that my brother's body would not be touched mm -hmm. until we receive word from our supervisors and will escalate the situation to see if we can give you guys an exception. As soon as I picked up my sister from uh, <coughs> the airport, and we went to the DCA, the first thing the DCA said is that the autopsy report has been completed. Without our consent, without our knowledge, yeah. our brother's body has been cut open. His organs weighed for whatever reason. They took every single organ out of his body and weighed it because apparently that helped. And for them to do all that and say that in order to have a fair and impartial investigation, we have to see what happened. For them to mutilate my brother's body, yeah. go against our religion, Where's just the separation it, of church and state? Just to put that case in the hands of a prosecutor who's never prosecuted an officer, who let an officer who was caught with child pornography walk free. Yeah. And to think that we're going to get a fair and impartial investigation? No. No. It's, it's literally heartbreaking what the family has to go through, and it's strategic. There's a reason why the autopsy photos are not released. Because if I were to put Isaac's body up there, Nobody in this room who has a heart would see that that's justified. And for all the victims killed by police, if we saw their photos on the autopsy table displayed right now, nobody would have be having conversations about how we can help the police. It would be how we can provide resources for the family coping with this traumatic experience. If I brought my son's autopsy in here right now, you would know. This is hate crimes. These are hate crimes. And I know you, you guys shoot somebody that many times. There's seriously something wrong with you. And I know you guys invite families to speak at this and hope that we like you pretty much inviting families to this panel, it's to make it seem like they have a voice when really they sit, listen to all like the police apologists and everything, and then come on the mic and expose their trauma, talk about their trauma in the hopes of getting you guys to have an ounce of compassion and sympathy to understand what we go through. I haven't seen that at all. I didn't see that last working group. I didn't see it now. And you, we continue to not see that. Where is the compassion? Where is the sympathy? We're not going to come on here and talk about our brother's story because you want us to expose our trauma. We've already, we've already seen body cameras exposed all the time. You've seen Eric Garner. We've seen Philando Castile. We've seen Jamar Clarks. We've seen so many. And it may be the 21st century, but nothing has changed. We went from Emmett Till's mother having an open casket so people can see what uh, everyone has done, what was done to her son 
to now, 2019, releasing body cam footages and even autopsy reports so people can actually see what's going on, how the police are treating blacks in America today. Nothing has really changed. And if you really think about it, even our presence, us being here today, is us being like in trauma. Like Think about it. The, the police officers, that uniform, that uniform, those uniforms killed our loved ones. We don't want to go and protest at police departments, no. shut down highways, and then have those like multiple police cars, multiple police officers there. We, it, we don't do it because we want to, we do it because we have to. We relive that trauma every single day of our life after our loved ones are killed. We relive that trauma every single day. So for us to come on here and explain this to you, you've heard the story so many times, unarmed black men killed by police. You've heard that so many times. Not a single ounce of sympathy, not a single ounce of compassion. It's always how can we help these officers? How can we accommodate the blue? What can we do for them? They're so traumatized, they're broken, oh my God. You pick the profession. You pick the profession. And now it's getting to a point where the officers know that Already. We can keep telling you our traumatic stories again. Like my brother was shot so many times, they didn't have enough blood to do the toxicology. They had to take fluids from his forehead and his eyes. Like at the funeral, I had to cover his forehead with the towel so people could only see his eyes and mouth. His face was still frozen in the expression where he got shot. I had to take a cloth to close his mouth, and his eyes were frozen, so I couldn't. So you guys all like you guys hear these stories and you guys can hear a thousand more, but the real question is what are you guys gonna actually do about it? We're seeing all these resources for the police officers. But where are the resources? Where's the accountability? Where's the accountability? There will never be accountability if why you keep normalizing when you kill out people based why on do, your language. Why why do BCA put a hold on their body in the medical examiner office? so that we can't see our children. Why? What is, what is so much that you gotta hide that you have these secret grand juries where the family cannot attend? That's another thing. All these lies and demonization and having trials without the family and without the lawyers Making sure we don't get the video footage we need. Making sure we don't get the records. We had to fire two lawyers to get the records and the video and, and the lies that they had put out on my son. We had to fire two lawyers to get that. So I suggest any mother out here that's having a hard time getting the records that they need, fire your lawyer. That's how you can get it. We found the lies. And when we protest, we're seen as just unprofessional, loud, annoying. And the city manager of Bloomington basically told me the only reason we're not going to release the autopsy report is because your unrest, the body camera, the body camera footage, is your unrest wasn't like Ferguson. So when we do a peaceful protest, we're seen as loud, arrogant, disruptive. But now we're being told that we're not getting body cameras because on, our unrest is not, is not like Ferguson. So what the city manager of Bloomington basically told us is to get the body cameras for my brother, we have to go out in the streets, riot, and break down buildings. And when we do that, we're seen as criminals, we're seen as 
we're seen as every stereotype that we're already made out to be. So it's either become the stereotype to get the body camera footage or do a peaceful protest and still be seen as criminal disruptors. So for the families, there's no win to this. There's no end to this. We have, there's literally nothing we can do. They are afraid for their lives and we're the ones getting killed. This is what this is about. They're afraid of their lives. We're the ones getting killed. I'm going to tell you something. They're brave men. It takes brave men to be police. You're afraid for your life. This ain't for you. This is not for you. I went on jobs that I was afraid for my life. I knew it wasn't for me. I would walk away. I would. It takes brave men to be police. I'm a witness. My whole family are police. So that might be just also a tactic that is used to continue to murder as well. You have to have an alibi. You have to have an excuse for why you murder somebody in cold blood. So of course you're going to say I was afraid for my life because what other alibi do you have to shoot somebody 52 times that's running away from you? Um, here is the pictures of Justin Mani while he was smashed. They smashed the smash skull in half um, after they wow. beat him severely. He had dog bites all over his body. Here's the dog bites all over Justin's body after they let the dog eat him or whatever, as they told his mother that they were going to do, that they were going to let the dog eat him alive. Um, and then here is where he came in. He's in the trash where they threw him in the dumpster behind the midway. He came to him the flat, uh, the flat bed at a live waste management. So this is what these people, these are serious, serious killers that are allowed to continue to be on the force. There is no accountability. I, we can no longer say uh, or go for the fact that they are afraid or they are scared. When, um, how are you scared when you're beating somebody senseless like this? When you're shooting somebody with their hands up and you're shooting them in their hands and feet, okay? You get their feet, they're down now. When you shoot them under the bottom of their feet, they're already down. Why are you still shooting? Jaffer had bullets in both hands, both feet, behind the ear, everywhere. Now, how the hell do you justify that? How the hell do you justify that? I'm talking to lawyers, I'm talking to DAs, I'm talking to judges. they're trying to do. And I kind of have some compassion for them. I forgive the officer that killed my son. It was four. And that was the hardest thing for me to do on this earth. But I tell you what, I have a God that vengeance is his, not mine. I don't want to be, I don't want to be like, I don't want to be like I want to be like Jesus Christ. I want to love. I want to love everyone. I want to do what Jesus did. I want to walk like Jesus. I want to talk like Jesus. There's no room in my heart to hate anyone. That police that they put in my building to intimidate me, I've shown him compassion and forgiveness because I was raised by two parents, two of the most wonderful parents in the world. My family, my life was prayed from before I got here. I come from the most proud people of my whole generation from the top to bottom. So my family prayed for me before I came to this world, and that's what I did for Jaffer. That's what I do for all my seeds that I have never seen. This is the type of family I come from. Jafford was already, he already had a spot in heaven. He was already prayed upon. Years before he came to this earth. I was too. That's what my people do. We're taught to love, not hate. 
I won't spur hate with your hate. I won't do it. These are hate crimes. These are not just their defending themselves. These are literally hate crimes that they're committing. You guys got to get out of the community. You got to do real investigations. What I want to say is that you can stop it if you want to. And I say this to the state, the city. If you don't stop, then this what you want. You want the black and brown dead. This can be stopped. I'm a witness. I'm a witness that uh, it don't have to take place. Because I come from the best police family. I come from a police family. Never killed anyone. Show only professionalism of protect, protecting and serving. You guys come out here, we can't call you. You're going to come kill us. You're not going to protect us. You're not going to serve us. This is totally not policing. I really appreciated seeing people take down notes as my brother was giving out suggestions. Um, but one suggestion I would make to this working group um, is before you can take on an issue as big as police violence, as big as police um, misconduct, 
I think if you want to tackle that issue head on, it first starts with your language. Dehumanizing always starts with language. When you call it deadly police encounters, you're normalizing it. When you put the officers first, you're normalizing it because they're already being heard and justified and protected by the system. The families are not. That's why we say black lives matter. <coughs> it's not ours matter more, it's we matter too. And we keep having to say that because we're not being heard. We are not being considered in situations when mental, Ill, uh, mental health comes into play. We're not, our mental health doesn't matter. Our trauma doesn't matter. It's all about the police. It's all centered around them. So when you change your language to be more inclusive, that's when you can actually begin to have a discussion, begin to have a more inclusive room, begin to have a more inclusive conversation because then you have, I guess you're healing in a way because you're putting these two people who are hurting in a room together. Because although I know the officers in the room probably have not been involved in officer-involved <coughs> shootings, you have one, one, like one trauma here, like where people that we loved have been killed by police. And to sit in a room and listen to police chiefs or whoever they are talk about police trauma without our side being heard, without our side being showed in presentation slides without any respect for us or just our stories, it's not gonna change anything. It's only no. gonna cause more hurt. It's only gonna cause more pain. I know um, Minnesota families weren't invited to the first working group because um, out of fear of uh, that reliving that trauma, but it's more traumatic to have yours invalidated and not heard and swept under the rug. Um, and so I really think that once you change your language to be more inclusive, once you change your language to stop normalizing behaviors that we all know are wrong, that's when we can take that leap and try to dive into an issue as big as um, tackling police misconduct and police violence. And when it comes to the family, you never assume. It's better that you go to them and speak with them. Exactly. And say, are you guys interested in doing this and this? We're working on this, are you guys going to do And it's better to get that no from the family than the family finding out about this situation online or whatever they need to be find it. So never assume what the family wants. You guys have ways of getting in contact with the family, so go out and reach out to the family. And hire, hire police from our community. That's what you do. Hire police from our community. See, I come from a community that police went to school with us. They went to church with us. We were in the grocery store together. Never killed anyone. You know why? Because they knew, everyone knew each other. And everyone loved each other. Don't send nobody over here that don't know nothing about my community. Don't send nobody over here that don't know the people of the community because they have no love for them. Where I come from, we went to school with all the polices. We went to church with all the polices. They were our community and we loved each other. Didn't matter what color we was. We were all different colors. But we went to school together. We graduated together. We prayed together. We did it. Those are the people we want to police our community. <coughs> the people, let them police their own community, okay? We don't need them. We need the ones that know us and love us. Because in my community, if they see my son out late at night, they put him in the car and say, come on, Jock, you're going home. We're taking you to, and we found Jock out here on this corner. You know, that's the kind of love I got from our police, where I come from. So all I'm saying, let them police their own community and let our own community police us. And in being inclusive, include the families that you invite into the panels, in 
the private meetings that lead up to this. So we can have our own presentation ready to propose our suggestions. Last time at the working, um, when we were at the working group, we brought in recommendations. But had we known about the meetings prior to this, we could have had the whole conversation and not had a protest and had that resolved. So just be more inclusive in language and representation and just <coughs> all around. And then one last thing I want to say is we need to make sure, so I'm aware that police departments have the jurisdiction to put officers on paid administrative leave, um, fire officers. We need to make sure these officers are at the bare minimum. If you guys want to put on paid administrative, uh, paid administrative leave, that's perfectly fine, but do it until it's the end of the investigation, until they're found not guilty. Because Don't give them a vacation for killing us. That's what we're saying. And basically, all the officers who shot and killed my brother, most of the officers were already back for three days. So we're having these conversations about PTSD, mental health, but an officer who just killed someone three days ago, we we think that they're healthy enough to get back to the job. Yes, they can go to a therapist. I'm pretty sure everyone can just tell the therapist the right answer is just so they can get back on the job. That doesn't seem too hard. So we need to make sure these officers are off the field until they're proven not guilty. Because right now, the officers who shot and kill people, they're out in the streets pulling people over, and the community is not comfortable with that. No. So I want to say thank you all for coming to share uh, your thoughts, the stories of your family. I want you to know that we, we do care and did want to listen. And on the schedule, actually, uh, affected families were first and are actually last, too. So I want you to know that. Um, we're listening carefully, taking notes. And uh, I just want to say this is not your last chance to have input into this process. It's going to be ongoing. You can come tell us what you want. You can also submit your ideas online. And what we're trying to do is reduce the trauma that you all have suffered. That's our goal. And by coming here, and I know some of you travel quite a long way, uh, you're helping us to do that. Uh, I will say that uh, I'm not sure that other families are here to testify or not. So if there are other families here, perhaps this is a time to let them share their thoughts. Uh, is there anybody else who wants to come up and talk about what happened to their loved one? Come on up. Just introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Don Damon. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for allowing uh, this time. I appreciate it. I didn't come with the intention to testify. Um, I came with the intention to listen, to learn, and to um, really find out what is happening uh, to begin to uh, hold accountable uh, our communities in um, sound policing. Uh, I'm a believer in police wellness. Um, I do believe that uh, some of the things that um, I've spoken with uh, Chief Redondo and Mayor Pry about are um, that I think there should be a full accounting of uh, police shootings. I feel like when there's a plane crash, the NTSB comes in and does a full uh, report and analysis with recommendations for re prevention of that. I don't feel like that's, that's the case. I don't even know that there is a process by which that happens on police shootings. Uh, I think that there's a judicial process uh, whether there's a charge or not a charge, and then, um, <clears throat> but I don't feel like the departments and the cities go back and do adequate uh, analysis as to what could have prevented it in a transparent way. And one of those ca uh, cities that I have seen that happen um, was in Toronto, and there's a uh, a report called the Akabuchi report that came out with 84 recommendations, and I'm. 
I expect that uh, for the Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis um, to go, come out with some sort of analysis after review of what was learned in the Mohammed Noor trial, and the shooting of Justine. Um, I expect that that's going to happen. Um, nobody's communicating with me whether that is going to happen, but I would like to see that. I think that that report is a template for how communities and how cities should respond uh, to a tragic um, murder of, of individuals by police. Yes, there was a judicial accounting uh, in court uh, for Mohammed Noor, um, and uh, we, we learned a lot, but I learned more in court than I did in the uh, 20 months prior to it. I learned more on the first day of court than I did in the 20 months prior because there was no communication um, about what had happened. I do believe that um, for, uh, you know, in, in Muhammad Noor's case, that there were things that were learned where by the uh, and police wellness and mental health, that his, there were some red flags that were uh, uh, seen early on and that that process did not seem to be uh, thorough. It didn't seem to be, I think that there were some things that could have been prevented had that uh, information through MMPI and some of that data that was uncovered in this investigation that followed through. So I believe that mental health starts at the beginning. It starts at who are we hiring? What is that process? What, who, uh, what is that analysis? And then who is it that's asking those questions? I think the city of Minneapolis has learned a lot in that process and has changed some things as a result of this. Um, I also um, believe that uh, the, the training um, that Mohammed Noor didn't follow his training. If, and I don't really know what that training is, but I would expect that there would be officers that would say, you know, we want to see your hands. Uh, back up from the car. Um, that there should just not be a shoot and ask questions later. Um, it was a, an egregious failure. I think anybody in this room can acknowledge that. It was an egregious failure of policing um, when Justine was shot. Um, but the legacy of Justine is that what can we learn? How can we prevent this so that other families don't have to sit at this table and talk about their trauma. And that's really all we can do at this point. So what are those things that can be learned? What can we, uh, I do believe that um, the earlier individuals that were here in talking about officer wellness um, in the 21st century policing, I believe that there is some things that I'd like to see action. You know, a, a PowerPoint with we support these things is great but um, I would expect that from this task force that there would be action. Um, similarly, with that report, I'd like to see a full accounting of, of what can be learned so that this can be prevented. Um, and I believe that that's why this panel was put together. I just feel that um, we want to see, see action. Um, so I thank you for your time, um, for your attention today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. And again, we want to acknowledge your loss and uh, thank you uh, of all the people who testified, the panel right before you and, and you. Nobody would blame you if you stayed home and just grieved. But you're doing more than that. You're coming here and helping us come to try to get to a better place. So we thank you for that. Ma'am. My name is Shara Blanche. Five years ago last night, I was at the wedding reception of Ashley and Brian Quinones. Brian was murdered by Richfield and Edina police less than a mile from my home. I also have a black son who lives in Richfield. Clearly this family is still processing. It's very early on for them. They are grieving. The pain that I have witnessed 
in this family is indescribable. I, Ashley and Brian's son Cameron is my son's age. They play hockey together. They have become better friends as a result of this. I've gotten close, closer to Ashley because of this as well. The lack of transparency in this investigation process is appalling. I'm not just speaking as a friend and as a mother. I'm also the daughter and granddaughter of police officers. My grandfather was one of the very first post instructors here in the state of Minnesota. He helped write those standards. So I also understand the perspective of being from a police family. I cannot ignore the pain and the suffering of families like the Quinones family. And I also know most of the families that were on the panel before me. Something has to change. Something has to be done by the state, by individual departments, to hold officers accountable. I have a number of ideas on what that could look like. The biggest idea that I have, that I haven't heard suggested, is that there's community input and oversight into those investigations. We have people in the community who know what investigations are supposed to look like. They should be observing those who are elected and then those who are appointed to serve us in this state. <clears throat> they should be overseeing BCA investigations. My father retired from the BCA. Chief Arredondo, I'm looking at you. My grandfather retired from Minneapolis as well in 1985. Or no, it was prior to 1985. That was his second retirement in 85. I don't believe that most police officers, based on my experience, having grown up in a police home, have any interest in their wellness or any interest in addressing PTSD. Because that was part of my reality as well. It's part of my reality as the, as the child and grandchild of police officers. We need to completely revamp the way that policing occurs. Because without officers being invested in that, they are going to continue to harm people over and over and over again. And the bottom line is that officers are afraid of brown skin. Brown and black skin. I shared that I am the mother of a biracial child as well. He was nine years old when he had his first bad interaction with Richfield police. Nine. His crime was sitting in my car while I ran into a gas station. He didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. But he came out, or I came out of the gas station to two officers, legs stood apart and arms crossed. My son still, he turns 14 in two weeks, he still will not sit in a car while I run into a store. That's trauma. That is trauma that every one of you wearing a uniform or a badge has inflicted on him. That is trauma that my father and grandfather inflicted on him. So when I found out that Brian Quinones was murdered less than a mile from my house, all I can say is that the impact in our community and to that family, that trauma will never go away. And that's on your hands. You have a responsibility to the family. You have a responsibility to the community. Again, I suggest that we have community oversight of investigations. Not this, oh, well, we'll release the reports when we get around to it, we'll release body cameras when it's convenient. Why has 
the Quinones family not seen the videos, the dash cam videos of Brian's murder. Yeah, we know he was live on Facebook when it happened. But why have they not seen the dash cam videos when Ronald Davis's family has? And that's been released. This idea that preventing unrest, is that really what you want? Do you really want people out there in the community being destructive? Is that helpful to anyone? Does that solve anything? No, what it does is it feeds into the narrative of the white supremacists in our communities that black and brown people are wrong and they're bad and that they deserve this. That is on you. Ev another suggestion. It needs to be a state law that officers wear body cameras. There is one officer in the city of Richfield and no officers in Edina that wear body cameras. The only officer in Richfield that wears a body, body camera is Nate Kinsey. And that's because he was put back to work by the Supreme Court of this state. I applaud my city leaders for firing, Brian Kin or for Nate, firing Nate Kinsey and for following through to the Supreme Court. That makes me feel safe. That, tr that makes me trust my city leaders. But now he's back on the street. What happens if next time it's my kid? What happens if it's one of his friends? That doesn't give us answers to what, to what happened to Brian. It needs to be a state law that all officers wear body cameras. We need to defund police positions and put that money into mental health. We need more social workers and mental health specialists. who respond to mental health calls, or in an, in an instance where people believe that there could be mental health involved. I do not believe that Brian Quinones was having a mental health crisis based on what I know of the days leading up to his murder. There is a perception by some people that he was. And there should have been someone there to respond in case that was actually the case for him. This isn't the last that you guys will see of me. I also have ideas about legislative changes that need to be made. We need to make changes to the Police Officer Discipline Act, or Police Officer Discipline Procedures Act. There's no reason that officers have a time, time frame from after an incident occurs to when they get interviewed for it. There's no reason that they get to review all video. Families don't get that. By doing that, we are giving the officers the ability to review the video and come up with a story that fits that video. That's a problem. That's all I have to say today. We will be fighting for justice for Brian Quinones. I expect that you guys, that this entire panel, and those sitting behind me who are here because you are interested in finding a solution to this, whether you are law enforcement or not, I expect that you also will want justice for Brian and for all other families. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It's now 1.05. Uh, we're supposed to start our prevention and training B panel uh, at 12.30. Uh, the time we took us to right, was right to do that, and I'm glad we did it. But it does put us in a situation where we gotta, uh, I think we still have uh, Lieutenant, I mean, Dr. Alex Eastman, who's gonna testify on the, on the officer wellness panel then we need to start the prevention and training panel. So, is he available? He is not available at this time. I'm sorry. Oh, he's not available. Eastman was going to be Skyped in. He's currently the uh, lieutenant of the Dallas Police Department. He's in New York patrolling the streets. Um, he is not available at this time. 
Okay. Well, then let me propose that we bring forth um, the uh, Jillian Nelson and Steve Wegen, Wegel, uh, Wickelgren. We'll go uh, in t at least until 1.30, and then uh, we have lunch scheduled at, from 1.30 to 2. Uh, I hope we can go over a little bit if, we, if they're in the middle of it. And then after that, we'll, we'll, we'll break for lunch. So, uh, if they're available, we can even pick up some after lunch. Yeah, we could be. Yeah, so we'll we'll be we'll stay flexible. But let's use the next uh, 30 minutes to at least get in a chunk of the testimony. Jillian Nelson and Steve Wickelgren, please come forward. Yeah, we we want to see him. You know what, folks? It looks like we're having an informal break. <laughs> so let's just take a formal break. We'll be back in uh, four, five minutes. Everybody go to the bathroom if you need to, <laughs> rather than hold it, you know. As soon as they start showing up, we'll get going. Good to see you. How you been doing? What's been the latest and the greatest? Oh, I know. Thank you so much. I know. You guys are doing good. 
I'm still thrilled with the name of your group. Awesome. No. Okay, no. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Good. We did a She does. She's brilliant. That kid laid it out. Mm -hmm. Six, 16 years old, huh? Get some testimony in before we break for lunch. Um, so, allow me to um, to uh, present our panel B: Prevention and Training. Jillian Nelson, Autism Society of Minnesota, and Steve uh, Wick Wickelgren, CIT Officers Association Clinical uh, Officer. So, uh, begin. Uh, I think oh. so, yeah.
Good morning. My name is Jillian Nelson, and I'm the Community Resource and Policy Advocate for the Autism Society of Minnesota. For nearly 50 years, the Autism Society of Minnesota has served the autism community by providing advocacy, education, and services that aim to improve the quality of life for those with autism, as well as those who support them. I am an autistic adult. When many people think of autism, they think of a young child in the corner, flapping his hands, playing with the train, not speaking. To many, that is the expected picture of autism. But autism is also the professional independent woman sitting in front of you today. Some individuals with autism have noticeable and widely recognizable characteristics. Others mask or internalize their differences until stress, discomfort, or dysregulation become apparent. You know someone with autism. We are part of every community and every culture. Nearly one in 59 individuals with, are living with autism, with numbers even higher in Minnesota, where we report a prevalence of one in 42. While prevalence has been generally climbing in the past 20 years, many believe that we are still systemically underdiagnosed amongst certain demographic groups. As autism has been diagnosed as the fastest growing developmental disorder in the United States, we certainly represent a strong component of the broader dis disability community, who in turn represent 30 to 50 percent of those killed by police using deadly force. Autism is a developmental disability by definition. It affects individuals throughout their entire lifespan. Characteristics and experiences of autistic <coughs> children, adolescents, and adults are incredibly diverse and subject to many intersecting variables. <coughs> Individuals with autism are unique from each other, and many individuals describe changes and challenges and abilities dependent on circumstances day to day. That being said, autism can affect an individual's verbal and nonverbal communication, social comprehension and behavior, adaptability to change, novel or unexpected circumstance, motor speed and coordination, sensory stimuli regulation and processing, as well as emotional and behavioral regulation. About one-third of autistic individuals have co-occurring intellectual disability, and many others have comorbid conditions, including but not limited to, to seizure disorders, co-occurring mental health diagnoses, or other med medical diagnosis. Despite the complexity of each individual autism diagnosis, practical and effective support strategies for individuals and families and professionals are available, and often relevant to others with similar disabilities and differences. There are a number of harmful misconceptions about autism. Many neurotypicals, that someone who doesn't have autism, have a unidimensional or stereotypical understanding of autism and cannot recognize autism across a broad spectrum. Despite community and professional con con confusion, autism is not a mental illness. Most importantly, prevalent studies have provided no persuasive evidence that those with autism are more violent than those without autism. Widespread misconceptions of autism certainly contribute to overt and subversive stigma. And as such, many autistic individuals and families fear repercussions that accompany disclosure. Mm. As a direct result of the particular characteristics of their disability, those with autism have an increased and multifaceted interface with law enforcement. This community is seven times more likely to become a victim of a crime because of vulnerability and 12 times more likely to become involved with the criminal justice system with no criminal intent. This level of vulnerability increases the potential for interface with law enforcement, which can lead to escalation in emergency interactions. Many unexpected emergency interactions occur when a person with autism is having a meltdown. To help you understand what that means, I want to share with you some insight about life as an autistic person. A meltdown is not a tantrum. It's not anger. It's not intentional. And I promise you, no one with autism ever woke up and said, today seems like a good day to have a meltdown. A meltdown is a visceral response of our body to overwhelming stress. It can be induced by sensory problems, 
or an unexpected change, or just an overload of demands and information. That meltdown can take many forms. Some shut down as everything implodes. Or others experience a behavior explosion where everything erupts outward. But whether it manifests externally or internally, whether it involves shouting and self-injurious behavior, or freezing and losing language skills like I do, it's not a moment where we're in control. The actions happen, but not consciously. It feels as though you're watching yourself, while you're trapped behind a screen of very noisy and intrusive thoughts. It's uncomfortable. And it comes with a great deal of shame and heartbreak that you weren't able to maintain control. No one wants to have a meltdown. And we always want it to be over as quickly and uneventfully as possible. When we look at many of these common behaviors for someone with autism in distress, it looks eerily similar to another list that police are familiar with pre-assault indicator list. Note, almost all of the characteristics and behaviors associated with autism are exactly those that officers learn are the precursors to a violent encounter. Though these behaviors are not distinctly related to, co to violence for someone with autism. I want to pose a quandary for you. How does an officer make the choice to protect or serve if they do not understand the situation in front of them? From an outside perspective, it may appear that the community needs to be protected from the person having a meltdown. When in fact, the person having the meltdown needs the support and assistance the most. Without understanding and training, we see a pattern of individuals with autism being treated as perpetrators for behavior that is directly connected to their disability. I think many would agree that we would not penalize someone with epilepsy for having a seizure or a diabetic person for an insulin reaction. Even an opioid overdose is treated medically rather than criminally. These reactions of the body that are not a willful choice are treated with appropriate intervention to restore the person's control of their body and mind. Often, the most helpful response to a meltdown is minimally invasive and focused on adjusting to the environment. Identify a trigger and address it. Help us self-regulate with a walk or sensory input. Help us be safe when we move from a state of escalation to a state of calm and clearer processing. The meltdown process is a lot like climbing a mountain. You don't get to the top in one step. And it also takes careful steps to get safely back down. However, this is not as what, ha what is happening. Many behavioral emergency calls and then police or EMS transport to a hospital or a 72 hour hold. Or minimally, a long and often traumatic process through the ER where the person experiences more sensory challenges, more change to routine, more stress. These are often the same circumstances that led to that initial meltdown. And often the experience ends with simply being sent home with the instruction, follow up with your care team. Yet we are returning that autistic person to their care team overstimulated, emotional, mistrusting, possibly traumatized in an attempt to help we are often doing more harm and placing the burden of support on families and caregivers. We are also conditioning a traumatized response to further interaction with law enforcement. And despite all these scenarios and challenges, this is the best case. Since the last meeting of this work group, the autism community has been devastated by the worst case scenario. On August 31st at 4.37 p.m., Kobe Heisler was shot and killed during an interaction with police. Friends and family described Kobe as funny and caring, intelligent. 
In fact, he scored a 36 on his ACT. It was disclosed that he was autistic. The loss of this cherished life is not the only consequence to that police call. This has struck fear in every person in our community. Families are saying, we can't dial 911. We can't do it because we don't know if our autistic person will be safe. For many, this increases fear of being in the community, specifically because we don't know how a police officer might react to autistic behavior. And this fear perpetuates isolation and anxiety. No one deserves to live like this. We're not here to assert that the cycle of harm is intentional. We acknowledge the great burden of responsibility of our law enforcement officers, as well as the critical complex factors that they must assess without the luxury of time. This is a systemic problem founded in stigma, stereotypes, and lack of appropriate education. When we know better, we do better. Both the officers and the community deserve the most effective tools and supports we can offer. The Autism Society of Minnesota would like to recommend three steps that can help change this cycle and create a safe community for people with disabilities, as well as the officers responding. Number one, training. We believe that education and training should be of the utmost priority for law enforcement departments as well as for legislators and administrators who share accountability for safe and higher quality outcomes. We believe that training can be used first to help officers identify and recognize behaviors associated with autism and similar disabilities, as well as offer realistic and evidence-based strategies for adapted response. These adapted responses should not be represented as algorithmic, but rather as a reflection of improved competency of emergency responders. Currently, standard for training, autism training, is at most one hour glimpse during a larger training module, a brief reference during a mental health or disability overview, or all too often, a short learning opportunity during roll call. As we've testified, our community is complex, and we fear that current standards are not adequate to give officers sufficient information let alone helpful guidance in how to make improved choices when interacting with individuals and families in the line of duty. We recommend that training needs to be informed and balanced by multiple stakeholders. The best model includes autistic people and families of multiple cultures, autism professionals, as well as officers. The curriculum must be comprehensive. It is not enough to teach someone that autism exists. The layers and the complexities of this community require an informed instructor who is able to address the wide range of autism presentation effectively. Otherwise, we risk enforcing stereotypes and leaving potentially dangerous, dangerous knowledge gaps. The training needs to focus on the defining and observable characteristics of autism, but must also increase more accurate understanding of these behaviors, both how they appear and the cause of function which we know to conflict with some police instinct, like we saw before with the pre-attack indicators list. Training should provide tools that are effective and accessible for law enforcement in the field to successfully work with people with autism and should include strategies that can support the multiple stages of any interaction. It should also be pointed out that support strategies that would be professionally recommended are not only effective for people with autism, but for those with many other disabilities and challenges regardless of formal disclosure. Awesome has been providing this model of training since 2011. We have trained many agencies throughout the state in cooperation with the St. Paul Police Department Care Program. Our training is fully post-board certified. We have received exceptional feedback from officers that have completed the training and have found that it has contributed to more positive community outcomes. Number two. Changes to emergency response and follow-up protocol. Departments can also improve response by dispatching non-police professionals to calls that identify individuals with disclosed or suspected disability. In a co-responder model, behavioral emergency calls can be dispatched to include response from a professional social worker 
or mental health worker in addition to police officers. In addition to improved team competency and safer acute outcomes, this model can ultimately reduce the rate of crisis calls and the unintentional penalization of individuals with disability or mental health related episodes. Over time, the goal is to affect systemic progress by improving the interface with vulnerable community members who often require long-term support and by building trust in a co-responder model that, pro that demonstrates a desire to help individuals mitigate crises rather than propagate cycles that often leave disabled individuals and families marginalized and isolated. Hmm. The Autism Society has also worked closely with the St. Paul Police Department in the creation of their CARE program, which stands for COP Autism Response Education. This program is constructed of five steps. Step one, provide comprehensive officer education with instruction by an autism professional. Step two, within that training session, provide police strategy education directed by a uniformed officer with personal ties to autism. Step three, facilitate officer interaction with an adult with autism. The program places importance on engaging with members of the community in an educational process to learn about our lives and experiences from the source. Step four, follow up, build relationships. Care officers follow up after a, cry, a call to connect with the autistic community members in a non-crisis situation. This, as a result, builds trust and rapport and creates clear social expectations for police interaction, which can better be applied in case of a future crisis. Step five, provide the same educational information for parents and individuals in the community to promote investment and buy into officer training. This also increases the likelihood of a family or individual disclosing and allows families to better understand what support and assistance they can expect. This reduces anxiety and creates a healthy dynamic interaction that allows for less tension during an emergency response. The utilization of a co-responder or care-like program is limited at this time, often because it's seen as cost prohibitive and requiring additional manpower. However, communities with successful implementation of these programs will see cost savings in the reduction of crisis interventions from repeat incidents. Both the co-responder model and the follow-up protocol of the care program address cause of the crisis and connect the person and family to services and supports to improve the outcome of the individual long term, rather than simply de-escalating a situation for a moment. When we address causation, we are giving people the potential to break out of the crisis cycle and improve quality of life. And lastly, number three, access to tools and technology. We promote utilizing technology to provide individualized indiv information to first responders. This can be done by using existing 911 platforms by allowing residents to attach information to their address, thereby requiring dispatch to relay this information to responding officers. Additional options include the community adoption of tools designed for fast, relevant information sharing. One tool with which we are familiar with is the Vitals Act which uses a beacon-based disclosure system that allows individuals to use technology to proactively disclose information regarding their unique needs to participate in law enforcement. This tool allows voluntary users to be in control of what information is provided and can include diagnoses, de-escalation information, emergency contacts, and more. It also has an option for real-time updating, which can be a game changer in an elopement situation. The system works through a Bluetooth signal that provides an alert to participating law enforcement within 80 feet of a user. It's also designed with privacy and protection in mind. A user profile cannot be accessed outside of that proximity window, and there is no search option for officers out of range. Though tools like these should never be mandated among individuals with disabilities, many community members are in favor of opting in in an effort to prevent further escalation upon officer engagement. Please note 
that while we do believe there is great potential in the use of such tools, our community tells us clearly <coughs> that they are not to be used in place of improved training and protocols, but rather as a piece of multifaceted and a diligent improvement effort. We wish to be clear, technology like Vitals is not unanimously well received in our community. However, most who have concerns have doubts that Vitals can be facilitated equitably by our police force. That is most certainly a concern worthy of consideration of this work group and of all who participate in the development of any potential meaningful solution and change in the heavy matters at hand. But to the point, making any suggestion without acknowledging the real impactful tension of inequity, particularly racial inequity, would be less meaningful and likely less successful. <clears throat> For our whole community to feel safe in Minnesota, to access the great community that is Minnesota, we need our efforts to be successful. This is why we reiterate our support for a multifaceted and integrated innovations for our community that must diligently consider equity from inception to implementation every step of the way. I want to say thank you for your time and attention today. The Autism Society will continue to be a resource for any necessary information or perspective that you require for your deliberation. Thank you very much. Let me just ask um, Mr. Uh, Wickelgren, uh, we know you're ready to go right now. Uh, we could break for about 30 minutes, come back and get you started right away. M panel members may have questions. Can you guys hang out till, till the, till uh, say, I'd say about 210. Is that okay? Okay, so with that, uh, our, uh, we'll break for a noontime break and uh, resume at 210. Thank you all very much.